All right, we are we are live, and hopefully, people will start chiming in. I see some folks already logging in, so we take a couple of seconds here. But uh, you know, as we are recording, there he goes. Potwood just joined us. Excellent, uh, Brian Marion. <laughs> excellent, uh, and many more. Boom, 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 boom. Uh, so it is Wednesday, September 22nd, uh, and it's another glorious day in paradise. I do remind you that my birthday is tomorrow, uh, so don't forget uh -huh. to say a prayer or send me an email or maybe a gift, uh, you know, of something. I mean, a fat check. <laughs> so, but before we get rolling here, let's uh, see how... Uh, John Butler gets us in the mood with a happy tune. Dr. Butler. There is a house in New Orleans. They call the rising sun. And it's been the ruin of many a poor boy. God, you know that I'm one. Brilliant. Johnny, how are you, sir? Hello. I'm just doing fine. There's a lot going on here. Um, but we're handling off. We're doing a, a lot of policies here in the, in the state of Texas. Uh, we have, we're going to do a joint program with Texas State and the, and the University of Texas on around energy uh, next year. I've been working on that uh, this morning. But, you know, it's, it's, it's okay. Uh, I think we have settled into a... Um, I call it a, a virus stability kind of mode. Uh, people are wearing their masks, uh, life goes on. And so it's pretty interesting here. Yeah, Happy birthday. Absolutely. Happy birthday. Absolutely. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad things are, you know, humming along uh, despite all the challenges. Llewellyn, how are you, sir? I'm very well indeed, thank you. We've uh, returned the corner here in East Texas, also known as New England. Um, <laughs> but uh, the, the uh, weather is broken. Fall is in the air, it's cooler, and uh, that gives you a certain spring to the step. Of course, down in Texas, you don't need that because you, you take various intoxicants to overcome lethargy, I hear. That's right, that's right, that's right. And we have a great guest today, and um, I'm going to say hello to him before I introduce him formally, but uh, Larry Tittle, how are you, sir? I see that you're in your headquarters conference room, uh, the how is everything? Yeah, everything's great. Um, glad to be joining today, um, being the first day of fall and a new day. Um, so, yeah, it's a pleasure. Excellent. Well, you know, I'm happy to say that Larry uh, and his company are uh, Texas State Cedar members. And I'm also happy to say that we had the opportunity of recognizing Larry's work as his company for 10 years or so uh, of innovation by awarding him the Digital 360 Summit and Entrepreneur of the Year. And um, if you don't know Larry, Larry has been a, a founder and CEO of Clear World and scratching his way to success, an overnight success of 10 years in the making and more to come. Uh, and uh, he'll tell us more about it, but Clear World is focused on off-grid and on-grid solar LED lighting solutions for rutways and sidewalks and apartment and condominium complexes and retail and corporate parking lots and university campuses and government institutions and military installations and sports installations and many more. And I'm happy to say also that he uh, as joined as an, as an infrastructure foundational uh, founding member of CEDAR we are going to build a showcase together uh, of some 16 street lights of his wonderful lights uh, on a new road that we're building here to connect um, the Star One building and the Smart Building and Infrastructure Lab that we broke ground on uh, two weeks ago. And, um, and that street will go live um, you know, fairly soon here in the next 90, 120 days. And uh, it would be a fantastic showcase of all the things that these streetlights can do, including connectivity, Wi-Fi, 5G, and, and the like. So, um, Larry, welcome to the show. 
Yeah, again, thanks for having me, everybody. So, so clearly, gentlemen, uh, I'm curious to uh, get a sense from, um, you know, COVID. I'm still mesmerized with the fact that I see uh, still some conference going only online only. Yet I watch on the TV, neck, neck to neck, elbow to elbow, all the football games and everybody is attending these football games. And, and I haven't seen no spikes of COVID anywhere. Uh, maybe I'm watching the wrong TV or what's happening, but I'm really curious about what's going on. And so, Johnny, what, what do you think is happening there? I mean, are we are we of the are we uh, you know uh, 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 you know in, in a good place or are we should be super worried? What's going to happen? I think we started out with the science of science from from CDC and et cetera. Now we're in the wisdom of the crowd. The great book in time. The wizard of the crowd asks one question. And the crowd brings us more wisdom than the science that we have. And I think Americans have taken it upon themselves to, to look at the wisdom of the crowd. And the wisdom of the crowd means that if we don't have an outbreak, perhaps everybody is, is uh, you know, we get to the point where everybody has had it, or perhaps everybody's had their shots. Because as we watch people gather, Andreas, remember, we don't know the percentage of people who have had their shots. Right. So one of the one of the consequences might be that people who are gathering uh, causally have taken their shots uh, already, mm -hmm. and so if we expect if we expect an outbreak, perhaps we do not get the outbreak. And of course, Americans have been very very uh, um, uh, coy about saying, "Okay, you don't have to take the shot uh, if you want to enter." Uh, my alma mater down in Baton Rouge at LSU made everybody take the shot before they entered the uh, Tiger Stadium. So I think there is a, uh, a lot of uh, uh, interest in what the science is. And I think it's the wisdom of the crowd. And, and what we don't know are the number of people who have taken that shots when they start to go to these events. Right, right, exactly. Llewellyn, what do you think? Where, where are we well, I, I, think, I think that it's unwise to be in crowds without a mask. But I want to tell you a little anecdote. Mm -hmm. I was at your great 360 conference in mm -hmm. Austin, as you know, and everybody was wearing masks. I was astounded at the basic discipline that people were exhibiting. I went next to Washington, where I went to a big diplomatic reception, and no one hmm. except one ambassador was wearing a mask. I was shocked because generally Washington, as you know, exudes a certain moral superiority about things like this, mm -hmm. uh, but nobody, including Samantha Powers, the head of USAID, was wearing a mask. And my wife, Linda, you know, and myself, we were shocked by this absolute lack of precaution. People from all over the world, no masks. Mm. It was astounding. Whereas I thought yours was very disciplined. I, obviously, it is it's not a great inconvenience to wear a mask. It's not lovely, but it's not a great pain or difficulty. Right. And caution suggests you veer on the side of the mask, not on the side of the wisdom of the crowd, with due respect to Dr. Butler. <laughs> I, get, I hear you. It's just fascinating. I find it interesting what's happening. And clearly, you know, the people are exhausted of not being able to to converse and talk and and share. So so Larry, I'm curious. You you run a an interesting company that has a interesting supply chain of partners, and you assemble your street lights in in uh, in um, New Orleans. And and, and t tell us a little bit about COVID in terms of any lessons learned or any impact that it has had in your business. Uh, and the demand from your customer, has it accelerated things? Has it slowed down things? What, what, what can you share? Yeah, great question. So uh, for us, you know, only speaking specific to uh, things that happened to our business, we, uh, it, was, it was slow in the beginning, you know, say uh, March all the way through, um, let's call it November timeframe. And, you know, whether it's budgets or what have you, um, we were very fortunate and blessed to be able to work with um, some cities um, with our partners, uh, City of Dallas, uh, City of Virginia Beach, uh, Matthew, and Lancaster uh, to be able to get um, some COVID-2 money 
where we were able in December uh, by year end uh, implement our solution providing Wi-Fi at community centers, schools, libraries, uh, residential areas, fire stations. And so, you know, because of the uh, remote learning and work aspects that the COVID has also brought, um, allowed us to participate and, and, and really you know, in a positive way, not just, hey, this helped us adding to our bottom line, but, you know, really, you know, being part of making a difference uh, in, in my mind and in, in our, in, in the company uh, the rep and the folks that represent us, um, you know, that and everybody that it impact in a positive way, it was, it was really great to be part of it. Right, 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 absolutely. Interesting. So, yeah. so go ahead, Johnny. I have a question. You, know, you, you talked about how you adjusted. And on this program, we've talked about a, a lot about new business models. How did COVID affect, affect your traditional business model? And how did you pivot uh, when you take it, when you're able to take advantage of new ideas or ways of thinking, if you look at how people are working at home, did it have an impact on your, on your business? How, how did you handle that as, as a, uh, as, as a business person? Yeah, I mean, for the, for the core of the business itself and the operation, certainly you want to, you know, look to the experts and understand and always keep an eye on, you know, and make adjustments, whether it's masks at the front door whether it's uh, taking temperatures, you know, whatever it may be, you know, naturally following the rules and being part of that internally. Um, from a business uh, perspective, you know, given that we work with many cities um, and, and private developments and things of that nature um, in the public view, you know, in public spaces, um, there's, there has been shifts. So whether it's a retail shift that may have hurt businesses and and others, uh, restaurants and, and service type organizations, um, or the businesses that have then become remote, um, specific to us and providing wireless services um, or added light for security or whatever it may be, um, that, that gave us the opportunity in COVID to, to grow 70%. Um, so that, again, that was just something specific to us, but you know, being able to be nimble to changes especially what's, what's been taking place in a bigger picture that is totally out of our control. Um, really, you just have to roll with the punches and make the best of it. And, um, and that's really what we've done. Okay, excellent. Llewellyn? Yeah, I'd like to ask uh, quite a few questions of Larry, but first of all, how can I measure your company by employees, by turnover, by uh, uh, number of installations? Sure. How can we get some sort of idea for the size of your company? Yeah, so we um so we're we're self-funded, uh, pay as you go, small company. Um, we have over ten years. Um, in the last couple of years, we have sold to um, over 120 cities. Um, that has really been our bread and butter as small projects, um, you know, one-offs as as we continue to grow. Um, the business has has been comprised of what I consider to be three compartments. So um, low hanging fruit, uh, middle, middle term, let's call it cities or, you know, even larger opportunities, uh, utilities and co-ops or standards or, you know, Oklahoma DOT or whoever that has standards in place that we adhere to. Um, we try to be as, as flexible as possible. Um, and honestly, we, we've been, you know, taking it as it comes. Okay, well, that's interesting. Uh, when I was trying to research the company, uh, I got the impression that you rely on solar power. Is that correct? Are your light, is your lighting largely solar uh, driven? Yeah, so um, I actually invented the, the solution. Um, it, these are flexible solar panels with battery storage and controls. Um, it's the only one like it in the world. Um, it actually retrofits to new or existing infrastructure. So some of our customers, um, about half of them, want to retrofit and, and have a, a fully contained light source where we started. But then as the, I guess the market has matured, it then becomes um, no infrastructure um, or it becomes uh, smart applications such as, you know, cameras and Wi-Fi or 911 call buttons for schools and universities and or environmental sensors, you know, out west for the fires or flooding 
out east in some of those areas. So, you know, it, it, it's changing, it's evolving very rapidly. And, you know, the way I view us today is as a redundant uh, power source, as clear will be in the core, um, or really, you know, smart infrastructure, um, the iPhone of smart infrastructure with a lot of very varying applications that can be built upon it. That's very interesting. Uh, is the uh, is the light pole in the city the sort of center point of your technology, or does it have other applications unassociated with city lighting? Sure. So, um, so it actually has many different offerings. Um, so, from gunshot real time uh, gunshot detection with cameras that pan, tilt, zoom, and record, uh, USB charging ports. Um, license plate readers, Wi-Fi, um, you know, there's just a, a wide array, uh, security cameras, there's just a wide array of applications that, that we provide. And part of being a CEDAR member, um, our, my vision um, that, you know, goes back six months to a year ago is to creating uh, teams of, you know, um, very highly educated, ambitious students that can, create the, the next thing that, you know, not just being cool, but things that make cities safer and more efficient as we move forward, just as applications would on, on your phone, per se. Right, right. So, so, so Larry, when you think about, when you think about um, um, the projects that you are working on, give us a sense for some of the key projects that are coming and, and, and where are those deployments going to take place? So I know that, I know that for example, uh, you have been talking or um, potentially doing something with the World Cup in Qatar and in and, and other in places. Can you give us a sense for a few of those uh, successes that are coming down? Yeah, so sure. Um, we, we have several of them from you know, Duke Energy, a uh, nine state solar lighting program approval uh, to developers, whether it's Mappy Homes uh, for Celebration Village um, in Disney or, or other large builders or developers um, that may or may not want to um, team up with a utility company. Um, for us, we, we actually partner um, with lots of different folks. So there's been instances where I've actually called, you know, Southern companies, an associate of mine, and said, hey, uh, buddy, um, you know, we have a city, the city of Augusta, Georgia, um, down at um, City Hall that wants to put our, our uh, retrofits on all of their poles to showcase their city. Um, is that okay? You know, what do you think about it? And, you know, very candidly, hey, Larry, you know, this is a new infrastructure. Um, this is infrastructure that we haven't, you know, had our break even on that, you know, we would like to focus on retrofits or new projects. And so, you know, and I respect those type of relationships um, informally, you know, understanding, you know, all the players of, of the game and, and what everybody's agenda is, you know, to create not a... a a landscape of competition, but a landscape um, that we all, as an ecosystem of partners, can complement each other's um, initiatives and innovations. Yeah, I, I have a question about risk. You know, you know, I have a, a my uh, keynote speech at the Digital Three Hundred and Sixty World. We have lots of technology. I want to know about the business models, but it's if you look at what you're doing in terms of systems and the data that it it, it, it might it will. Um, kickoff um, and how cities can not, not only be safer, but how cities can predict the future. Right now, I view cities as sitting on a platform. I don't see cities as sitting on, on dirt anymore, although you need the dirt for the buildings. How do you see what your company is doing with create wealth, create new business models around the different kind of sensors that's happening? As the kids become involved and they get very, very creative. So lots of technology is not just for signal purposes, how do you see the wealth coming in and the business models for cities uh, that would take the place of the zoo, take the place of writing tickets and mm -hmm. automobiles? How, how, how do you, how do you uh, envision that business, those business models with your technology? 
Great question. So I, I understand there's a digital divide. I understand we're now going into a digital transformation. Um, I am involved with several smart city projects uh, across America um, where they're putting fiber rings around the cities, uh, bringing fiber to our smart poles, and then come all of the smart applications along with that. Um, we are part of T-Mobile's Innovation Center, Qualcomm, a military partner, Vectris, uh, Nokia is a reseller. Um, you know, Comcast Smart Cities is coming out of the gate. And so, you know, again, I, I view this as, um, and I've actually seen the business models where the citizens of, of these cities uh, privately, um, you know, through high-speed internet services um, to consumers and businesses are, are, you know, on the front of it, um, putting the bill because what happens is if I come to your city and it becomes a, a digital city um, and it's a safe city and it's more efficient and I'm not sitting in traffic all of the time, um, well, I want, to, I want to come to your city. I want to live in your city. And so, you know, the business model previously would have been, you know, the services. Well, this solution is now has the ability, you know, for cities to create added services or added revenue streams once the funders get back their, their dollars, you know, based on the, the bigger picture, that there, there is a, a, a revenue sharing mechanism that could be created um, rather than raising taxes on, on the citizens of their particular cities or counties. Okay, thank you. I have a question. Uh, yeah. It occurs to me that one of the benefits uh, of the using solar power is that when you have extreme weather and a utility loses power, you can, in fact, where the, where the light poles have not been damaged, the lights will be on. This would seem to me like a very important dimension. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, over the last couple, two, two and a half years, I actually created a a uh, multi-tenant, multi-carrier smart pole that has the, that actually you can get to the radios, the carrier's radios from ground height, um, where all of the wires um, go up to the, to the top, to the smart compartment, where you have all of your wireless antennas in a nice looking form factor with no attachments, no wires, no nothing uh, for that matter. And so, you know, so it looks good, but, but more importantly, um, what is the, the usefulness of that? Well, well, certainly, um, you know, the usefulness becomes the foundational resilience, redundant power source. And so recently I learned that 98% of, of the power outages, not the extreme ones, but the uh, power outages are, occur for a period of three hours, right? And so we have the ability to increase our, our battery pack sizing to bring either AC power in to, from the grid to the battery packs or, or have just like a vehicle, a battery, uh, having a tank um, where you have the solar power. But to be, for us to be able to provide one to six hours of backup time based on those loads that the customers are choosing and then, uh, and of course, understanding the balance of power um, will go a long way. So as the networks continue to grow and critical infrastructure is becoming, uh, you know, or I should say, you know, keeps getting stacked on and becomes even more important related to drones and vehicles and pedestrians to infrastructure, um, you're not gonna be able to go without it um, as natural disasters and hurricanes and tornadoes continue to increase. So, so, uh, so as I understand it, Larry, your your high end configuration uh, generates 1.2 kilowatts and has a energy storage for 2.4 kilowatts. So, assuming those numbers and the numbers could be bigger, you know, with innovation and more hard work, uh, you know, there are roughly 26 million uh, streetlights in America. So, if you multiply the 2.4 kilowatts times the 26 million that gives you 62 gigawatts or 62,000 megawatts. Uh, that is a significant number of um, energy that could be sitting on those streetlights across America to do all kinds of interesting things. 
Yeah, and to your point, Andres, um, really, we haven't even, you know, and it's going to take time. We haven't even touched the tip of the iceberg. Um, however, you know, to not on the generation or transmission side, but on the distribution level, being able to have energy that goes back and forth to smooth out the grid for any, you know, any noise or any issues that, that may be presented, you know, you know, yeah, you can take, you can take 700, you can take 800 or even more and create a megawatt, five megawatts, 10 megawatts of power and literally move it around as, as need be um, when you have those type of challenges. And so, yes, that definitely creates, um, you know, a, an even added value as, as the market continues to mature. Absolutely, absolutely. And I imagine also, Larry, that uh, since we haven't brought it up, it's good to bring it up that the, the kind of sensors on the street lights include things like flooding sensors and air quality sensors and humidity and temperature and and things like that and maybe you know the notion of uh, counting traffic foot traffic bicycles going by pets going by cars going by you know uh, taking a sense for you know presence you know are people around turn on the lights or not if nobody's around turn it off kind of thing. Uh, the possibilities are kind of endless, right? Oh, yeah. And, you know, it's what I really like about what we do here is uh, when people come and, and they you know, share with me, you know, their their thoughts and, and their views and, you know, how we could really contribute, you know, um, not just to the environment, to you know, society as a whole. And, you know, even military bases, um, you know, we have a partner of a large partner, military partner who says, okay, well, what about if we, you know, had a 911 call button where you hit that call button and let's say the lights start to flash, the siren comes on, um, the troops uh, localized are identified, the alerts go out, or even say a drone comes over the wall and, you know, based on the an an analytics real time, you can identify what manufacturer it is of that drone. And so the computing power and the things that we will eventually do at the edge um, and, and things that I have seen happening in the marketplace, it's, it's really an exciting time today that we, where we live and, and how we're now you know, moving into, you know, not, not taking anything away from, you know, the microwave or, you know, the refrigerator or the basic essentials of life that, you know, we have taken uh, for granted or, or past centuries um, that we have that they have not had, but just to be at this place in time and experiencing based on computing all of the, all of the things that we can do um, is just amazing to me and, and really, um, you know, happy to be here and be part of these things that are taking yeah. place. I, I have a question. Yeah. Um, what is the interoperability? There are a lot of companies offering something similar, not identical by any means. Uh, in the marketplace, I went and interviewed at one of them. Uh, how does a city decide that it should go wholly with yours or 50% with yours, light pole and 50% with somebody else's? Um, what is the interoperability? Would they be in a bad situation if they had only a third of one type and a third of another, and then, you know, uh, two thirds of something else. Sure, sure. No, that's a really good question. Um, and so the way we have, have done this to date, and I intend to continue on with, is as talking about having an ecosystem of, of partners. You know, I personally uh, don't need a big slice of the pie, but what I'd like to do, just because the market and the evolution of the market is now moving a whole lot quicker, is then looking at the customer's needs and what is the customer looking for? And does the customer have a preference? Because for us, it's just a load. And so if I use a Halifane, a Curity, a Cooper, a Phillips light, it, it really doesn't matter um, if you have a standard in place and you like a certain flavor of an ice cream. But to me, it's more about the, the relationship. And so you know, we, we validate all of the technologies before they go out into the marketplace. 
because naturally we're putting our name on it and we're standing by it for 10 years or more uh, in some instances. And so, you know, I'm, the more the merrier to me. I'm, I'm happy to continue to work with others and entertain um, whatever um, the customers are looking for, basically. Well, I have a question that's obvious you're out front with the relationship between technology and where we're moving to in the future. You, mean, you mentioned the, the drones and, and people flying around in the air like bumblebees, as we're trying to do here uh, in Austin, Texas. And, and my question is, do you think, uh, and I've been doing the smart cities with Andreas, do you think that uh, the thinking about what you're doing is lagging in terms of the future, much like it lagged with many other kinds of technology? That is, as you, as, as, as you talk to cities around the country, can they see the future with you? A connected city that's very, very different? Or do you find that uh, it is like many companies they're sort of locked in their everyday activities, looking forward to retirement rather than looking at new things in the future. I mean, honestly, I think it's a combination of both. Um, you do have those folks that, you know, status quo do as everybody else does. And, and I get it, it's okay. And then you, have, you do have people that <laughs> you want to contribute to society, whether it's sustainability, uh, climate change, whatever. There's a lot of initiatives that are taking place out there in the world. And so, you know, I think that even if you look at, you know, the infrastructure bill, the plan and our aging infrastructure, um, it's a big beast. And so what was created, you know, 50, 60 years ago related to infrastructure and the grid as, as we know it today, you know, that's changing. So, there is a lot of hesitation um, to really figure out what will be the next big thing. But a lot of that does come with money and people thinking out of the box creatively and innovatively um, and then really partnering. Um, and so, you know, I do see it happening. It's at a slower rate. Uh, COVID has slowed things down, um, but we, we are now, I believe, going into the next phase. Um, related to smart cities that everybody can be proud of. Right. So, Larry, I know, I know that uh, uh, you, you got all kinds of challenges in New Orleans. I, and by the way, uh, any, 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 any problems with the flooding and the rains and anything like that on your operation? No, I was very fortunate, um, not to brag, but and and again, there, you know, there's a lot of people out there in the world that have it. Uh, a lot, a lot worse than I do, and I feel for them, and I pray for them. Um, for us, yes, we we had our smart pole installed at our corporate facility here, and our smart pole was fully intact, not an issue. Um, our building was was fully intact, and you know, and that was just a blessing. Whereas the neighbor across the street, the whole front of his building came off, and so you know, you just never know. So you, again, you just have to be grateful you know, and, and feel for those that are that are less fortunate and, and try to, you know, help out as much as you can. Yeah, and and you and I have talked a little bit about the possibility, and again, I, I, I underline it as a possibility that you may be thinking that perhaps, um, you know, moving uh, Clear World 2.0 to someplace like Texas may be in the, in the cards, and perhaps uh, that's part of the reason and the excitement about joining Texas State Cedar and all the things that are going on there. Any, any, anything you want to share on that? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So definitely uh, Texas is in the cards for, for many reasons, both corporately um, uh, related to a, a nice uh, corporate landscape and then personal landscape, uh, but, but dish, additionally, the, the quality of life, you know, um, and they're not taking away from any other areas of, across the U.S., but you know I believe that Austin and Austin area is, is the new Silicon Valley, and a lot of companies, as you probably know, uh, at least uh, 40 large companies from Silicon Valley have moved out of California to Texas, and you know I I see a lot of value there, and so. You know, whatever at the end of the day, you know, whether home becomes, you know, the Dallas area or or Austin area, um, those are one of the two spots. And, um, you know, and either one is just a, you know, a hop, skip and a jump away. So 
you know, to be in Texas and to be part of some of the things that I've seen um, with Texas and um, it's just, it's, it's great. So that's, that's definitely on the roadmap as, as the next step. Excellent. I think those, those are wonderful thoughts. Lou Ellen was not smiling, by the way, because I, we I, won again. I, I'm entirely Lou Ellen was not smiling. We have won again. But let me say this. I'm, I'm neither opposed to Texas nor am I a booster of it. I'm neutral. Uh, and That's it's right. none, of my, none of my business where Larry wants to put his company. Um, and I don't know what his recreations are and why he would go to Texas, where the recreation are uh, somewhat different from the rest of the country, I gather. Never mind. Uh, my question is, Larry, you're at the top of a long and very competitive supply chain. What it goes to make your products uh, is much in demand. I imagine chips, batteries, etc., are very strained in the marketplace. How are you surviving? Yeah, yeah, great question. So, you know, whenever there's challenges, creates opportunities. And just like with any organization, uh, you know, and not taking it in any way from, you know, China or, or any other nation for that, for that matter. But, you know, when things, um, you know, have a tendency to go astray and, you know, 25% uh, uh, tariffs come about, well, then you say, okay, well, maybe we go to Mexico, right? And maybe it's closer and it's cheaper. In fact, even coming out of recently coming out of China, you know, you're talking five to six thousand dollars a container last year for a 40 foot. And at last check, now you're talking 18 to 20,000. And, and it's just the and, and tariffs for that matter. And so, you know, the thing is, is you always have to, and, and again, you have to change with the times and, and, and based on political changes. Um, you know, a lot of times things are out of, out of our control. And so you inevitably to stay in business and to grow a business, you have to change with the times. And so that's what we have done is we start to source and validate from, you know, different parts of the world when there's uncertainty. Yeah. Tips are important okay. to you, I imagine. Uh yeah, I mean, everything is important. And so even aluminum prices have gone up exponentially um, and so we, we have to always gauge, you know, what, where we go next, right? And so that's a continual process um, of reevaluating our supply chain and, 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 uh, and it's just a function of, of being strategic. And one, one, of the, one of the advantages of the uh, discrete manufacturing business that Larry is in is that you have to, uh, as a company, uh, secure your production capacity a year in advance or try to. And so uh, people need to uh, create a queue and put a down deposit to get in the line for the queue for the production capacity. So so that gives them a little bit of visibility of demand. And yeah, that's a good point. So, so to Andre's point, you know, again, we're, we're still a small company, but we maintain 800 to a million dollars of inventory at all times to to be able to execute on pilots or small orders that our customers have to keep the term. And so we can keep the term to four to eight weeks, whereas to get an aluminum pole, you know, from one of the larger uh, pole providers, you're talking about 22 weeks. And so, you know, we have a city, I, I'll just mention it, you know, the city of Austin came recently, you know, we already have a, a downtown project with them, uh, 20 units in a, um, Red River enhancement in the, uh, you know, where the homeless areas are to light, light it up. And, and uh, you know, uh, and I, I think I talked about the Department of Justice and decreases in crime. Um, but what's really nice um, for us is when somebody comes to us and says, hey, you know, our transit um, areas have, um, we have, naturally we have a lot of sun and we're trying to do some sort of awnings or protect them from the sun what do you what do you think and so yesterday i had a, another call with the city of austin and said okay well what about this um let's create an awning that has some led lights under it and solar at the top and a digital billboard that shows you when the bus is coming and and where the bus is located and a directory or a map 
you know, showing you of, of various locations that naturally could potentially be reoccurring revenue streams. Um, so there's, you know, there's a lot of things that, you know, that you can do. And, and so we say, hey, you know, we, we can create and build and, and customize, whether it's colors or various molds, you know, quickly, right? So that's the, that's the beauty of being a, a smaller uh, company that you're able to pivot a lot faster than large companies and continue to be competitive. Yeah, give me give me a give me a time out here to do my my show, uh, sharing of the Digital 360 Summit. So we just had our conference. I think that uh, most people that went, uh, or now actually everybody that I've talked to, said it was fantastic and phenomenal. They're looking forward to the 2022 edition. We are concocting a new location. Uh, we're early to say uh, any commitments on that, but. Uh, John Butler has been uh, uh, pushing some uh, re new ideas and a new collaboration and new setting and in, in, uh, in Austin. And so when the time comes, we will talk about it and when it's all baked. But uh, I'm excited to say that we are looking forward to the 2022 edition. And I want to, uh, you know, uh, really uh, thank again all the keynotes and sponsors and speakers uh, that uh, we're part of this year's event uh, here in uh, in the South Austin area in San Marcos. Uh, I thought it was phenomenal and uh, very grateful for the content and the videos that are being worked on. And I want to thank again Texas State for sponsoring the Digital Roundtable. So, uh, you know, Larry, uh, you know, lots of stuff going on with utilities and energy and 5G and electric vehicles. It seems like you are in the middle of this uh, incredibly powerful revolution on how we do everything uh, and lots of business models emerging out of that. Uh, I know, for example, that John Butler uh, loves the notion of your, your uh, sort of your swim lane of innovation, streetlights could create, you know, say 20 or 30 new viable business models uh, do you, uh, Larry, do you uh, find yourself being, uh, uh, in addition to obviously getting your needs for your own capital to grow as a company, do you find yourself being asked to be a mentor, to help people? Do you guys work with startups? Do you guys, uh, tell, tell me a little bit about that. Oh, did we lose Larry? Yeah, can you say it one more time? Can you please repeat that? Yeah, I know. I, I was curious if, if you are being asked to be a mentor or collaborate with startups and, and, and the, with the notion that your, your solution is enabling a new platform of potential other opportunities. And... No, I think that's what's most important to us is continual education and helping others that you know have dreams and desires of their own. And so as part of that, being part of Cedar and Texas State's innovations um, and engaging the community around Texas State, the cities around them, will go a long way. And so that that's really what what I want to do. And you know, I know John has a relationship with um, you know LSU, and uh, you know Dr. Ali Ali from the engineering department. I actually uh, you know gave a little speech to all the alumni in engineering um, a couple years back. And you know, so anytime that I can be part of those type of um, efforts, I love it. So I think so. In terms of supply chain, you know, I'm a New Orleans boy. I was born in New Orleans, and I was raised across the lake. And but in terms of your uh, supply chain, by moving to Austin, it is a dynamic kind of situation. There are lots of companies moving here. And more importantly, there are lots of companies that's moving here that will also do the molding and also the manufacturing as we move forward. My question that in the pure supply chain, New Orleans sits sort of there at the um, intersection of a kind of international with the Mississippi and, and the Gulf coming together there. How do you see the change in supply chain? Or will it affect you by moving out of uh, the city of my birth uh, to the city where I work? Do you see is an advantage of moving to Austin in terms of the supply chain? Or have you had supply chain problems moving things to New Orleans? How do you see that uh, your move will affect the supply chain? 
Yeah, no, actually, you know, not taking anything away from New Orleans or Louisiana generally, because I, I love the, the flavor here, per se. But, uh, but also, you know, for us, given that we have a national presence, um, you know, I view Texas and Austin, you know, very strategic in, you know, being middle of the way to be able to, um, you know, catch the West Coast and then catch the East Coast as well, or even Midwest for that matter. And so, you know, we do have some supplies coming from Mexico um, straight up based on the economics of labor, you know, because it, though we would love to get to the point of being totally robotic, um, we're just not there yet. Um, um, but so, so my point is, is, um, you know, I, I feel that tech, uh, Austin and more specifically uh, Texas generally can can serve many more customers, both East and West Coast. Okay. Excellent. Llewellyn, anything else? Uh, well, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in, in smart cities, as all four of us are, and uh, I think they're coming and I think they're, they're going to be extraordinary, except there is pushback in one area. We saw it, of course, in Canada, where a project uh, sponsored by Google was canceled, and that is concern over privacy. As we get more and more uh, data, we have less and less privacy. And if there is a big pushback point, it seems to me it's that. It's not highly mobilized at the moment, but it's there. When I talk about uh, smart cities or give a lecture, the first question that I'm asked almost always, sometimes the second or third, but it's always up at the top, is what about privacy? Mm -hmm. uh, and I wonder if you've given any thought to that, because you're part of the infrastructure which people believe will uh, remove some of that entitlement to privacy. Sure. So I guess we, sh we could look at it one way, and we could say, you know, whatever happens in the dark comes to light. But, you know, I will give you a, a driving example, you know, that not being a politician by any means, but just imagine a world where uh, security is of the utmost importance. And, you know, I talked a bit about um, my family or your family or our family being affected, directly affected by crime, you know, in the streets, right, per se. But... You know, just like, for example, the whole George Floyd incident where the, you know, the young girl actually recorded the incident real time. And if it wasn't for her, then it would be a different story, right? But what if she wasn't there where in a world we now live in or will live in where there's actually a, an objective point of view? Let's call it a drone that is actually recording the incident real time looking down with a camera, recording the scene, a whatever it is, you know, a um, whether it's a crime happening or whether it's uh, keeping the police officers, um, you, know, you know, doing the right thing or the citizens are doing the right thing. I mean, they, they have put measures in place related to body cams, but just like, you know, we all are humans and body cams can be you know, not used properly, right? And so- well, selling to, to cities, how do you, how receptive do you find them? Uh, is it, uh, do you find people who know what you're talking about or is there a, a divide between your sophistication and the sophistication of people who run the yeah, city? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there will, there will always be a divide in society until you educate. And in some instances, educate the masses. And part of that will become a larger adoption, right? And so it's an adoption to the masses that everybody is being educated and going in the right direction. Not saying that it's the herd mentality, but you know, things uh, become slower to adopt. And so nobody- Larry, 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 I was thinking more of the city management. Um, when I talk to the city managers, some are extraordinarily gifted, bright people, and some are not. And how is it, how do you find it interfacing with them? Do you have to do a lot of teaching, a lot of explaining? No, no, not really. And, you know, I try, you have to simplify 
the thoughts and, and what you're trying to get across. And, you know, quite honestly, if you get it, you get it. If you don't, well, I'll see you at the next pass. And so there are a lot of um, innovative municipalities and people generally that get it. And those are the people we want to work with initially because the, um, they, they're, they know, they understand it. And so once you understand it, and, and if you don't, it's okay too, because you're not saying that you're a follower or a leader, but you're just slow to adopt. And so that, that's what we have to do. Thank you. Yeah, I also I also find it interesting that with in the sense of the light, the street light is a hardware piece, but there is a software platform that manages the whole uh, street light, right? And 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 so the notion that the street light is a platform and it's configurable, you don't have to have the camera um, added on day one. You could add the camera later. Or, or right. you, know, you, you don't need the cameras everywhere. You can only put it in certain places. And so that, that flexibility allows for that whole notion of when the adoption uh, takes place, when, when the time is right kind of thing. And so that's why I like the, the whole yeah. notion of the design. And, and obviously Larry has this vision of turning that, that into steroids with Cedar and the, and the projects of creating the next applications. Yeah, but not just that, you know, to your point, Andres, um, you know, in working with the police force, um, you know, through the analytics and feedback, what areas within the city may be prone to higher crime areas. And so those areas, we need gunshot detection and cameras, whereas, you know, other parts of the city, we need other services based on the traffic flow. And so, yes, I mean, we do house this on a platform as a service. Um, on a dashboard where you can see everything real time and control the city and the flow of the city. And so the city will become a, a living, breathing organism, um, you know, as, as the innovations continue. Yeah, so, you know, I know that uh, Llewellyn is gonna have a hard stop here soon. So Larry, uh, I wanna thank you for sharing with us. Uh, we would love to have you again in the future. And obviously we will continue to work with you at Texas State and others. Uh, uh, and so I don't know if there are any parting thoughts from your point of view and the guys, but um, it, now would be a good time to, anything else you wanna share, any, any event coming up or anything you wanna plug in? Well, uh, next week we'll be at uh, Qualcomm Smart City Accelerator. Um, they've got uh, some mayors there, uh, Magic Johnson, uh, will be there speaking and um, it'll be at San Diego's uh, campus, a smart city campus. And then uh, my team will be in at AUSA um, with our military partner Vectris uh, for the base of the future. Um, and then the following week, I will be at Smart City Connect um, the fall um, in, at the Gaylord in Maryland, um, you know, with Nokia and Jacobs Engineering. So, you know, this is a um, you know, time of the year where, where we really have to, you know, push and, you know, and, and create opportunities and build on the relationships that we have existing. I do want to say that I'm, I am really happy and proud to be part of the organization, the things that you've put together, the team. I mean, it's, it's amazing to me, you know, uh, from what I've been part of to see how it all comes together you know, as we are moving to literally make the world a better place. And so for you and your team to take that lead, that initiative, you know, I'm just really pleased to be part of it. Great, very, very interesting, Larry, mm -hmm. and I, I wish you luck. I think you're going to be hugely successful. Um, I, I hope that, uh, that it goes as smoothly as it appears to be going. I have a final question. What did you do before you had your eureka moment and started lighting. Yeah, so I had the privilege of growing up in family businesses um, where I was, say, 16, 18, 19, uh, behind the desk at a pawn shop, uh, looking up things and wheeling, dealing, and uh, from manufacturing, my dad had invented some things uh, early on. and. So I grew up in, in family businesses, including construction. And so 
I've had um, uh, uh, I've had a good upbringing and and uh, and understanding all of the aspects of a small business um, has you know provided me the ability to go out there and and really you know hone in on some skills uh, take it into the future and and again um, it you know it's it's been inspired you know God inspired to allow me to be in the place that I'm in. And, and really, you know, be part of something much bigger than myself, to be honest. Thank you. Honey? But, and Larry, I wish you luck in the future. If you need any help with relocating, whether it's, it's um, a physical place to stay, where to put the plant, uh, we can talk about that. We know lots of people in the Austin area as it has built. We have a great corridor between Austin and San Antonio, Austin and Waco. Uh, Austin and Dallas, um, lots of room in Texas. So uh, right. if you decide to leave the Bourbon Street, good times of, of the city of my birth to, to Austin, Texas, uh, then you can uh, train in your moccasins for cowboy boots and welcome you. I love uh, it. Johnny, are you in a position of strained loyalties? Are you feeling bad? <laughs> uh, no, I'm not feeling bad because I think that uh, um, there are great opportunities for his kind of company in, in here, you know, in, in the Texas area. Yeah. I love the city of my birth, and uh, we, we've always gone through a lot of stuff, but uh, it's working on different kind of things. But given where he is in time and space, I think it would be good for him to move to this fast-growing corridor uh, to, to grow his enterprise. I, I do have, a, I do have an, um, an announcement to make that is a public announcement that I just read today that came out yesterday. Uh, in detail, I was reading it earlier today. Evergy, the electric utility, the, the, the investor-owned electric utility in multiple states, but in primarily in New Orleans, uh, in, 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 in the state of, uh, uh, of Louisiana, uh, Evergy just signed uh, a $30 million, $30 million licensing agreement with Anterix to deploy private LTE uh, to build their smart grid. Uh, and Anterix is a company that uh, uh, Larry and his company are, are talking to there. Anterix is a CEDAR member. Uh, and, uh, and so Larry is looking at potentially putting the, those, uh, those, uh, that technology on his streetlights as well. That is good. I'm writing an article about Anterix and I'm hoping to get a telephone call in two minutes from Rob Schwartz. So yeah, well, tell, 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 tell Rob congratulations on the Evergy announcement and to make sure that his boys keep talking to Clear World. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, not taking anything away from anybody for that matter, but we are also involved with uh, Travis Johnson, who is a state representative of Louisiana for the northern neck of Louisiana. Um, he's got uh, 13 mayors and five parishes where he, he's got uh, a bill that has passed um, who actually uh, is now uh, pushing uh, sustainability. It's actually a sustainability district uh, with about $900 million that we will be part of, you know, putting our solutions, including rural broadband all over uh, the Northern neck of Louisiana. So there's a lot of exciting things to come for us. And, awesome. You know, glad to be part of all of awesome. everybody else. Thank you, Larry. Thank you so much. John, Johnny, take us away. Thank you. I would do that. And I'll talk about uh, my great state of uh, Louisiana again. There is a house in New Orleans. They call the rising sun. And it's been the road of many a poor boy. God, you know that I'm one. I love it. Thank you. <laughs> lots, lots going on in lots going on in New Orleans and Louisiana. That's great. It is. You know, we're working with uh, Larry. We're working with uh, a northern city for a small city. I've been working with Minden, Louisiana. Nice. That's up. That's up north. And uh, are you start recording? Uh, yeah. Yeah, 